Hello, everybody, and welcome to our session today. I am really glad that you are all making time to join us for this um, for this presentation, uh, this workshop, really, from Beth and Brian um, talking to us about universal design for learning. Um, and I am lucky enough to work with both um, Beth and Brian at Plymouth State University here in New Hampshire, um, and I have actually benefited from learning about UDL already from um, Beth a couple of times in different series that um, that we've done and really excited that she and Brian uh, were able to join us today to talk about universal design for learning. Um, we are the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State and we focus on um, faculty development among other things and lots of us are pretty excited about universal design and uh, we range from beginners to experts. Uh, so I'm sure there'll be a diversity um, of familiarity with the topic amongst you guys as well. So with that, I will turn it over with gratitude to Beth and Brian. All right, um, so thanks so much everyone for coming um, and thank you Robin and the collab for hosting us. Um, I am going to share my screen here. It's always a little bit, takes me a little bit longer than I anticipate that it will. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> All right. Can people just give me a quick thumbs up if they can see that? Thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, so this is an introduction to UDL. We're going to be talking about issues of access and going over some of the core ideas of universal design for learning. Um, if you are interested in following along, um, there's a tiny URL in the corner. Um, it's tinyurl.com slash PSU collab UDL. Um, and this, I have that on the first couple of slides as well, in case you don't get it here. Um, so just in terms of introductions, um, as Robin said, I'm Beth Fornoff. I'm the program coordinator for graduate special education programs here at Plymouth State, and my pronouns are she and her. I invite Brian to introduce himself too. <laughs> Making sure I unmuted myself to do that. Uh, <laughs> hi everyone, I'm Brian Massio. I'm a new faculty this year in the elementary ed and youth development program, and my preferred pronouns are he and him. Um, so we invite you, I know some of you have already introduced yourselves in the chat, but um, feel free to keep them coming as, as people join. Um, it's great to have you all here. Um, so again, our tiny URL is at the bottom of this page. I also just wanted to um, acknowledge that a lot of the information we're going to be talking through and sharing is through work that Brian and I have done together um, and in collaboration with CAST, which is the Center for Applied Special Technology. Um, and their website is www.cast.org. They're out of Wakefield, Massachusetts, and they're a research nonprofit that actually was instrumental in really developing what we know now to be universal design for learning. Um, so a lot of the slides and, and some of the metaphors we're going to be using um, have come out of much of the wonderful research that is going on at CAST. So if you are not familiar with them or with their website, we recommend that you check it out and we'll also be pointing you to some resources at the end of this, um, this presentation. In terms of our goals for today's session, um, we're going to be exploring some of the core ideas of UDL. Um, we're going to discuss some examples of UDL in practice. We're, and we're going to end by brainstorming ourselves and brainstorming with all of you um, about ways to apply UDL in our teaching. Um, so we just wanna take a moment to invite you to share some of your goals for today's session in the chat. So we can take a quick minute and do that.
So um, please feel free to continue sharing. Um, very much looking forward to having conversation throughout this time with all of you um, and hearing um, about how UDL might be applying in your everyday work, in your teaching. Um, just a couple of logistical things before we get started. Um, I'm actually going to start with the second item on this slide first. Um, so first off, um, UDL is very much grounded in accessibility. So we just want to remind everyone to please self-regulate as needed. Um, you know, cameras on or off are fine with us. I think, um, you know, Robin mentioned she sort of power muted everyone, but there will be opportunities for you to unmute and ask questions. Feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, in a moment, Brian's going to be showing you a space um, called Jamboard where you can also ask questions. Um, but if you need to eat, if you need to drink, if you need to take a break, if you need to tend to someone in your family or a pet, um, don't feel like you need to hide them or shush them. Um, you know, just do what you need to do to be comfortable. Um, we want this to be um, a space where you can. That's one of the benefits, right, of of a, <laughs> of a virtual space is that we can all kind of tend to those um, basic needs or family needs as we have them. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment um, and I'm going to ask Brian to share his screen to introduce Jamboard. If you're using the slides, Jamboard is linked here um, and we'll be using this as a space for questions and conversation. Great. I also just put the link to the Jamboard uh, in as well. Um, there we go. Sorry, I'm sharing screen and I got thrown off because uh, I was for some reason looking for your PowerPoint rather than the actual <laughs> screen. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about Jamboard. So um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with Jamboard already. This is a um, this is a Google tool, so it's free. Um, and it also is can easily be used uh, with or without a Google account um, that you can access it in order to create your own. And we're not going to right now talk about how to create your own, but just simply how to use it as participants. If folks want to learn a little afterwards, we're happy to be able to help you. So you can see here this Jamboard. Um, it has five frames. You, up at the top here, um, you can see, so this is frame one out of five. And the way to move between frames is just simply clicking the right and left arrows. Um, right now we have frames one through four are set up for the four main ideas of UDL, which we'll be talking about. So this is a way to potentially collect your questions as we're going. We're gonna pause about midway through today's presentation to ask if folks have questions, but sometimes it's hard to just hold on to them on your own head while you're trying to also take in information. So you can feel free to put them on the Jamboard and we'll use that to guide us. There's a lot of ways to use this. I'm gonna show you one in particular that I think is particularly helpful um, for this type of setting where we're not trying to create something formal and that's the sticky note. So if you see over here on the left-hand side, you have several things that you can choose from. So a pen, you can start drawing, uh, you can use the eraser to erase what you drew. Um, and then the select tools, tool is very helpful. But this fourth one down, the sticky note, when you click on it, as you can see what pops up here is for you to be writing on a sticky note. And you can, you can change colors. We're, we're not gonna play with all that right now, although you're welcome to do so if you're leaving sticky notes. Um, and so you can type in here, you know, the question you have. Um, I'd not recommend literally writing those words in there. That won't be that helpful during our session, but whatever you're gonna write there, and then you can hit save. Um, and then it, it's ready for you to write another, but once you're done, you can click off of it. And you have this here, the question you have. Um, and you can move it anywhere on that screen. You can also increase the size of it. You can play with it and rotate it if you wish. Um, the one thing that I would mention is that it does have some sort of character limit. And, and I haven't actually played with it enough to figure out exactly what the character limit is. Um, but and it doesn't tell you when you're typing your sticky note that you've exceeded it. So you can have put something on there and only the first bit of it is visible. And it doesn't matter if you make the sticky note larger, it, it won't then allow the rest of it on there. Um, you need to edit it, which you can easily do if you click on one uh, and go to the three dots in the upper corner, you can edit it and then move things off of it if you needed to. So please feel free to use this as we're going through. Um, and we're going to be, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this sticky note. Um, and we're going to be, in the presentation, you'll see we're going to be going through these four ideas um, a single time where we're going to be talking about them more uh, 
conceptually, and then we're going to circle back through some of them again to talk about them in more concrete ways. So the Jamboard would be a really good place for you, particularly during the first time through, if you're capturing ideas, questions you have. Um, as you put them on there, I will be monitoring the Jamboard, and I might be moving around the sticky notes to organize them a little bit, knowing how Beth and I may utilize them throughout the presentation today. So does anyone have any questions about the use of Jamboard? Yeah, and I noticed a lot of people in the chat were just sharing their experiences with Jamboard um, and with um, Padlet as well, which um, operates and it can operate in some some parallel and, and similar ways. Um, so we will be sharing um, a link to a Padlet at the end of the presentation as well that just has some resources. Um, but yeah, uh, Jamboard is one of those things that I learned about from Brian and um, he uses as a teaching tool in the class that we co-teach and it's it's really great um, and it's it's kind of a lot of fun like once you start playing with it and it's really low stakes like there's no names attached to anything so um it's a great way to you know get participation without you know kind of that pressure or that and you, know, you get that anonymity for students who might be uncomfortable asking questions all right so um let me go back to screen sharing here So as Brian said, we're going to be going through um, some of the core ideas that I mentioned as part of our goals. Um, and then um, we'll talk about those for the first part. We're actually going to start with a video and then we'll be discussing some examples of UDL in our practice and brainstorming. So um, for this first part, it's going to be a lot of information, um, but please feel free to use that Jamboard as needed. Um, so UDL is kind of this really big um, and can sometimes feel like an overwhelming approach, right? Because there are so many different pieces. And one of the troubling yet wonderful aspects about UDL is that it's not a thing, right? It's not this sort of thing that you do. Um, and it can be really difficult to define. Um, but it also, I think that's where some of the beauty of it comes in is that you can really um, think about it as this evolving way of approaching your practice over time. And one of the things, because um, Brian and I have been working together um, on UDL related stuff in both our teaching and research for um, several years now, um, across several institutions now, and in different um, programs um, that we found is that there it really helps us when we ground UDL in some of the in some of their core ideas. So we're going to talk about a little bit about what those ideas are. So the first idea is that variability is the norm, that clear goals and flexible means are central when you're using UDL, that barriers are in the environment and not the learner. And that what's essential for some is actually gonna be beneficial for all. So we're gonna go into each of these in a little bit of detail, but first we'd like to share a video with you that, I'm gonna pause because it's gonna talk over me. Um, so this is a video called The Myth of Average, um, and it's a TED Talk by Todd Rose, who um, was with CAST, I think, for a few years, Brian? Yeah, he was with CAST for a few years. Um, and worked in the mind, brain, and education. I guess still is at Harvard, right? In the mind, brain, and education program at Harvard. He is, and I'll put out no relation to David Rose, despite them both being there at the same time, same last name. Yeah. Um, so this is a TED talk where he talks about this idea of average that we're going to use um, as kind of a launching point for our conversation around this idea of variability being the norm. Um, so I'm going to start this video just from here. I've embedded it, which I think means that everybody's going to be able to hear it. But again, if you could just give me a quick thumbs up. Um, we're, only, we're not going to watch the entire thing, although we do recommend that you watch it at some, all of it at some point. Um, we're only going to watch about the first six minutes or so. <laughs> Welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Todd Rose. It's 1952, and the Air Force has a problem. They've got good pilots flying better planes, but they're getting worse results, and they don't know why. And for a while, they blame the pilots, they even blame the technology. They eventually got around to blaming the flight instructors, but it turned out that the problem was actually with the cockpit. Let me explain. Imagine you're a fighter pilot. 
you're operating a machine that in some cases can travel faster than the speed of sound and where issues between success and failure, sometimes life and death, can be measured in split seconds. If you're a fighter pilot, you know that your performance depends fundamentally on the fit between you and your cockpit. Because after all, what good is the best technology in the world if you can't reach the critical instruments when you need them the most? But this presents a challenge for the Air Force because obviously pilots are not the same size. So the issue is, how do you design one cockpit that can fit the most individuals? For a long time, it was assumed that you could do this by designing for the average pilot. That almost seems intuitively right. If you design something that fit for the average size person, wouldn't it fit most people? It seems right, but it's actually wrong. And 60 years ago, an Air Force researcher, Gilbert Daniels, proved to the world just how wrong this really is and what it was costing us. Here's how he did it. He studied over 4,000 pilots and he measured them on 10 dimensions of size. And he asked a very simple question. How many of these pilots are average on all 10 dimensions? The assumption was that most of them would be. Do you know how many really were? Zero. Gilbert Daniels proved there was no such thing as an average pilot. Instead, what he found was that every single pilot had what we call a jagged size profile, right? It means, not, it means, it means you're not, no one's at the same on every dimension. And this makes sense. Just because you're the tallest person doesn't mean you're the heaviest, doesn't mean you have the broadest shoulders or the longest torso. But this is tricky because if every pilot has a jagged size profile and you design a cockpit on average, you've literally designed it for nobody. So the Air Force realized they had a problem and their response was bold. They banned the average meaning that moving forward, they refused to buy fighter jets where the cockpit was designed for an average sized pilot. And instead, they demanded that the companies who built these planes design them to the edges of dimensions of size, meaning that rather than design for say the average height, they wanted a cockpit that could accommodate as close to the shortest pilot and the tallest pilot as the technology would allow. Now, the companies that made these planes, as you could imagine, weren't happy, right? They argued and lobbied and they said, it's going to be impossible or at least impossibly expensive to build a flexible cockpit. But once they realized that the Air Force wasn't going to budge, suddenly it was possible. And it turned out it wasn't that expensive. And in fact, they made great strides leveraging simple solutions that we all take for granted in our everyday life, like adjustable seats. And as a result, the Air Force not only improved the performance of the pilots that they already had, but they dramatically expanded their talent pool. And today, we have the most diverse pool of fighter pilots ever. But here's the thing, many of our top pilots would have never fit in a cockpit designed on average. So most of us have never sat in the cockpit of a $150 million fighter jet, right? But we've all sat in the classroom. And I would argue, I would, I would argue that these are the cockpits of our economy. 
so we're going to stop there. Um, I would invite you to drop any comments that you have into the chat or any thoughts. Um, and again, this is linked in the slides if you'd like to watch um, the full video at some point. Um, but so we wanted to start with this concept of variability because it's something that I think many of us may intuitively know. Um, but when it gets applied to this idea of classrooms or structures that are already existing, um, it's, it becomes a little bit hard to really think about how to design for that or how to plan for that or how to acknowledge that. Um, so CAST defined variability as the ever-changing mix of strengths and challenges that make up each learner. This isn't just saying, however, that all kids are different, right? <laughs> or all my students are different, or everybody has, you know, strengths and weaknesses, right? It goes a little bit beyond that because what it does is it says knowing and accepting that variability exists means that as the educator, as the instructor, I should be planning for that, right? I should be designing for that. The problem tends to come in, not when we're thinking about variability so much, but when we start to think about using that variability to put people into categories and then making decisions based on those categories. I know this is a weird image, <laughs> but I promise you it connects. I'm gonna invite Brian to unmute and talk more about it. Yes, I, I get invited in to talk about the weird image. Yes. Um, so yes, ears are freaky and they're very strange. Um, yeah, so, you know, Beth and I, um, we also co-teach a, a course within uh, the education programs uh, on inclusive education. And so these are conversations we're having directly with our students as well as future educators. And one of the difficult things around this concept of variability is the norm. Uh, is that um, people legitimately point out, but some of these differences, it's not like these differences are made up. The differences are real. And they're right, differences are real. And so we tend to put this actually in conversation with other types of human differences um, that we have come to understand as being socially constructed. So this is along the lines of understanding that ability and disability is socially constructed, the social model of disability, very much in the same vein of how people talk about race being a social construct. And some of the pushback that we get, not only from our students, but when we're out in schools talking with teachers is, right, but the differences are real. The skin color is real, the difference of skin colors is an actual real thing. Whether someone is in a wheelchair is an actual real difference. And, I think what this requires is a different framing of, sure, there are differences, but what differences matter in a way that require us to categorize? And so an example I've actually been using for a few years is earlobe length. Earlobe length and size for human beings has great variability. There's, there's large differences between ear, people's earlobe size, shape, um, and connectivity to, to your face. But we don't categorize people based on earlobe shape. At least most of us don't. And so that's a difference. It's a real difference. It's biological, but it's not one that we use to categorize people. At this moment in our society, we would actually consider it super weird if we did. But if we did, we would see after a few generations massive social stratification in who's the CEOs and who's the janitors, in you know, different things that would evolve, laws and social norms because of categorization, not because the differences innately under themselves make a difference in life. Um, and so this shift of mindset about understanding human difference as difference in variability rather than something to be categorized even if while categorizing, we follow that up with saying, but we should treat people nicely or nicer, even if they're in that category. The moment we start using categories, 
we, we are doomed to have inequity. And so this mindset shift that UDL does call for um, is an understanding of variability as the norm um, and that that's a part of the human condition. Beth, I think we can get the ears off the screen. As a side note, I will just say, don't ever Google earlobes, <laughs> at least Google images, because when Brian and I were playing this, I did exactly that, and it was <laughs> kind of uncomfortable. There were some really hurting earlobes there. Our second core concept that we want to talk about after variability is the norm is this idea of clear goals and flexible means. So most of you who are familiar with UDL to some extent are going to know that a lot of it is based or was based initially on some research into um, how learning happens and a lot of work that was done in the learning sciences. And one of the things that we found that really resonates with our own practice is this idea that that our thinking tends to be very goal driven, right? Learning tends to be a goal driven process. And that has to do with how we kind of tackle learning tasks, right? So if we're not making our learning goals explicit, our students aren't going to have any way of knowing what the target is or how to reach it or when they've achieved it. It's kind of like trying to follow a recipe without knowing what it is you're trying to bake, right? If you don't have that sort of end product in mind or at least an idea of what it is, you don't know when you've made it, whether it's a cake, or a meatloaf or some other type of souffle, right? But when you have a clear, explicit learning goal, then your students are empowered to choose their best pathway to meet that goal. And there's a crucial, crucial distinction there between the explicitness and clarity of the goal and the pathway to, to achieve that goal. Oftentimes, what we see is that the goals and the means to achieving the goal get very conflated. But if we're thinking about UDL, we wanna make sure that we're disentangling those two, right? We can have a very clear goal, but we can allow our learners the independence and the choice in how to get there. So one way of thinking about this is by thinking about a GPS, right? Um, which is something that many of us use well, I use it almost daily. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily use it because I don't know where I'm going, um, but I use it to think about not only what's my goal, but really what are the things that I need to consider in order to meet my goal. So one of the things that Brian and I shared with our students just very recently was the fact that we both live a good 90 minutes away from Plymouth State. And so on any given day, when we need to drive to Plymouth, we have some choices to think about. Sometimes, we might be running late and we want to think about, okay, what's the fastest possible way I can get there so that my students aren't locked out of the class. Sometimes, maybe this has happened to me, I for some reason didn't have my easy pass, right? Or I don't have cash for tolls and I need to think about a way that avoids tolls so that I can get there without having to stop and pay. Sometimes I'm just in more of a leisurely mood, right? And I might want a more scenic route. <laughs> doesn't happen terribly often with gas prices being what they are. But the point is that I have the choice of which, how I want to get there, and they're all getting me to that same, same destination, right? So same thing with, oops, jumped a little ahead. Um, same thing as Todd Rose talked about, right? The Air Force's goal was having really expert pilots it was just a matter of figuring out how we were going to get there. The third core concept that we want to talk about is this idea that barriers are in the environment and not in the learner. So he was really clear in his talk that the problem, and he actually used this language, the problem in that situation with the Air Force was in the cockpit, right? And people who were trying to solve this problem when it was still unknown were willing to look at any possible way to explain the problem. They were situating the problem in the students and the equipment and the technology in the flight instructors, which probably as educators feels very familiar to all of us. But when we're situating barriers in our students or in ourselves, we're not allowing ourselves the opportunity to address 
any of those issues, right? We're not fixing people, <laughs> nor do we have the authority to decide what is a problem. If we situate barriers within the environment, we're ultimately empowered as educators to attend to those. And we have a professional obligation to attend to those. A lot of this, as Brian alluded to, has to do with the social model of disability. So there was a great piece um, that came out by Kurt Dudley Marling about 17, 18 years ago now, that was called The Social Construction of Learning Disabilities. And he talks about how so often when there are issues in school and children are struggling, our inclination is to say, what's wrong with Johnny? When in fact, what we should be saying is what's wrong with an institution that produces so much failure? And then beyond that, what's wrong with a culture that produced an institution that produces so much failure? And I would add that allows it to continue. So situating problems as external, situating them as barriers as external to students really allows us the opportunity to look at our environments, our practice and our design. And that can be really hard and uncomfortable um, because then it kind of gets to the point where it's like, okay, if we're not doing something, <laughs> what is that saying? But it's a necessary step in this process because barriers can really interfere with the goal. So I want to share a short story um, about how barriers can interfere with the goal. Um, so those of you who might have done some professional learning with CAST in the past or who know the work of some CAST authors might know Alison Posey. She is a um, UDL educator. She works for CAST and she's a researcher. And um, some of the work that Brian and I have done with, with our colleagues, um, we've done a self-study on UDL um, in teacher education. And we presented this work at some conferences. And at a conference a few years ago, this woman, Alison Posey, was doing the keynote. And she had this great um, introduction. You know, one of the things that's great about um, folks from CAST is they often try to make things really interactive, right? So she had this opening keynote. We all sit down in this big auditorium and, um, you know, it's, it's a little less formal than like a typical academic conference, but still, you know, everybody's kind of sitting nicely in their seats and listening. And Allison says, you know what? I want us all to have the opportunity to get to know each other. Let's network a little bit, right? Um, you know, we're all here. We're going to be spending the entire day together. I'd like to start this keynote by asking you all to get up and just go and introduce yourself to someone you don't know. Maybe, you know, learn a little bit about them, share a little bit about your work, you know, why you're both here, why you're connected to UDL. And right before we were about to get up and she said, oh, um, I'm also a little worried because um, most of us are going to be sitting all day, you know, while we're in this conference. So, I think we should also get some exercise. So she said, introduce yourself, but I want you to hop to them. You know, pretend you're like on a pogo stick and just hop. Now this is a big auditorium with like steps, you know, it's like stadium seating. She said, so, you know, do this, you know, introduce yourself, you know, meet someone new and hop to get there. And I'll give you five minutes. So she kind of lets us loose. And um, I, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to what other people were doing, but there was no way I was gonna hop. You know, I mean, you're like dressed in a professional cover. I was a graduate student at the time. I was super self-conscious about this. I was like, yeah, I'm not, not gonna do that. So I went and I met someone and came back and you know, she kind of gathered us all together. And she said, well, why didn't people hop? <laughs> There's a range of answers, you know, like, oh, it, it felt a little weird. I'm not sure, you know, why it was. And, um, you know, eventually we kind of realized like that interfered with the goal. Our goal for us was to network and meet other people. And by introducing a secondary goal, it actually prevented many of us from doing the first. Some people decided not to network because they didn't want to hop. They were rule followers and they were like, well, if I have to hop, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Some people did hop, but got like really kind of sweaty and out of breath from doing so. Some people couldn't hop, right? I mean, it's hard to hop up steps. If you have sore joints, if you're wearing high heels, that's just not an option for everyone. So barriers are anything that interferes with a goal. And sometimes competing goals can do just that. And they mask our ability to actually make those choices that allow us to meet the goal. So I think it's helpful to ask ourselves as we think about UDL, 
what are some pogo sticks in our own classes? The final core idea that we'd like to talk about is this idea that what's essential for some is beneficial for all. And every time I watch that Todd Rose talk and he shows this automatic seat, I'm always like, I can't even imagine the time where there wasn't like an automatic seat, right? <laughs> you know, it just seems like such an obvious thing to have available. Um, but the fact that it wasn't in these multi-million dollar aircrafts is kind of staggering. But when we think about the idea of what some people need, we realize that so much of accessibility isn't about individual accommodation. It's about ensuring a culture of access for everything. Things like automatic doors, like curb cuts, like closed captioning. All of these things are things that some people need, but they benefit a number of people who might not know that they need it, who might benefit from it without even really thinking about it. They don't have to have an identified disability in order to use these things. If you've ever tried to push a stroller or a grocery cart over a curb, you know the value of curb cuts and automatic doors. If you've ever been up folding laundry really late at night when everybody else in your house is sleeping, you know the advantage of closed captioning. <laughs> we tend to think in terms of individual accommodations. But what UDL asks us to do is to think more broadly about a culture of access and why not offer those accommodations to everyone in terms of just supporting a culture of access. So I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna see if there's any questions or anything you wanted to point us to in the Jamboard, Ryan. So I'd like to bring us in, and for those of you who have been using the Jamboard, thank you. Uh, and you might be wondering how it is that I'm organizing things and I'm moving some things to the right and left. Um, right now, at this point, um, <laughs> I, um, I would like, I'm going to focus on ones that I've moved to the right. <laughs> Um, throughout the different frames. Sorry, I'm looking out to the side and people now starting to move theirs. Um, and that some of these questions are, are conceptual in nature. And some I think are gonna bring us a little bit more to concrete examples. And let's talk about a thing that happens in a class. And we're gonna wait on those more concrete ones um, for just a little bit, because the, the next stage after we talk about touch base about some of these conceptual ones, is that Beth and I are gonna be sharing some concrete examples of how we use some of these uh, in ours. And we're gonna open it up to folks for questions. If you're thinking about, well, how do I do this in this scenario? Um, we wanna be able to have some time today to be able to talk about those things. So I am glancing now at things. I thought about it. <laughs> uh, well, that's really interesting. Uh, Robin <laughs> was talking about the drawing versus the sticky notes in that. So, um, I am going to just uh, share out some things that are that are on the Jamboard uh, that are more conceptual. So on the variability is the norm. I see here great point that things are socially that things that are socially constructed are not not real. We just can only understand these things, such as differences between humans, through our social lenses. Um, yes, that, that's a super helpful way to frame it. Uh, and, you know, Beth and I have a lot of conversations, both with each other about the work that we do, uh, but also directly with our students, uh, in that it's actually a really hard thing to wrap our heads around, this idea of things, differences being socially constructed, when we have been so socialized in a society to think of them as real. It's very hard to then imagine that there is a time and a circumstance under which that wouldn't be a thing. And what we have found with a lot of our students is that th they may nod along with us when we say it because they've heard it said before and they know they're supposed to agree with it. But, but as we start to ask them some more probing questions about it, what, what we have found is a lot of people, their instinct is to agree with the idea that treating people differently because of what category they're in, that's socially constructed. And, and a lot of people who nod 
when we say disability is socially constructed or race is socially constructed or gender is socially constructed, people who nod along, a lot of times what they're nodding to is the expectations that go with that, those are socially constructed or the treatment of people or the expectations of people that go with that, those are socially constructed, but not necessarily quite go as far as I understand. No, no, the categories themselves are socially constructed. That's a you know, that can be kind of mind blowing uh, to get to. And then I also see here- Think about that, can I-, I just No, please, this. please do. I'm yes. jumping in and I want you to know I've given you all the unmuting power. So, you know, you just you do what you want and Beth and Brian will have to suck it up. Um, but I think about that, I was just thinking about that in terms of blindness, right? Which is like such a continuum, right? Some people who are legally blind have a little bit of vision or whatever, but even people with like really, really, really bad vision, if they can correct it with glasses, like we don't call them blind, you know? And so it's it like, there's just so many ways in which, um, you know, no matter what you land on, you can, you can really show how in some contexts or at some moments, or if you changed the lens a little, that difference would just look radically different. Um, I think that is what, I mean, I wonder, it just seems like one of the big keys to help faculty or anybody understand how to do UDL is like, you really can't start with the accommodations or the tricks. You have to start by thinking about what your position, what your relationship is to difference, right? And how, yeah. Anyway, I'm just saying what you just said, but it's just giving me an aha mm. moment, so. It, it, you know, and it's one of those things that I think when you hear someone say it, it, it does make a lot of sense, but in practice, it's just so hard. You, you know, it, it's it's something that we have constantly revisited and gone back and forth, you know, the mindset shift and the strategies and, you know, we can't have one without the other, but, you know, it, and it becomes this sort of weird, like, super deep chicken or egg kind of thing, but it, it, it you do, you know, kind of have to keep revisiting it and, and thinking about why you're using both and, um, you know, just, just keep pushing for it. It's, it, and I think that's one of the tricky things, you know, as I said earlier, like that I sort of love and find frustrating about UDL is that it's, you don't just do it, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's something you kind of have to keep digging into. Yes. Um, so I, I just want to share real quick, the other sticky note that, we, that was very conceptual is uh, the quote design to the edges is something uh, that we want to hold on to. Uh, I would absolutely agree with that. I do see the other sticky note on here talking about where the where there could be competing variabilities that put things in conflict. I want to hold off on that until we talk talk more concretely about the classroom because I suspect there's probably some good examples that, that come with this that it, that would be worthwhile for us to get into rather than just talking about it in the abstraction. Um, the clear goals, flexible means, the one very large post-it note on there, uh, which I appreciate, which is about this idea of emergent goals. Let's hold off on that as well until we circle back around and talk about concrete, because I, I think that's actually a really important thing. Um, but let us share some examples first uh, before we get at that. And then same thing with the barriers in the environment, not the student. Talk about whether barriers interfere with process, not just goals. Um, actually, you know, I don't know if that's more, Beth, do you want to speak to that? Because I mean, my initial reaction when I see this, so it says, I wonder if barriers interfere with process as much as goals, or if we could think of it that way. Um, that's a really, that's a, that's a really interesting framing because in my mind, when, when I hear you say it interferes with the goal, what I hear is it interferes with people's ability to achieve the goal. Um, which I would have a hard time distinguishing from that interfering with the process. So I, I, I don't, I'm not sure how to think about that reframe. Beth? Does the person who um, put that on there, would they be, if they'd be willing to unmute and just um, share a little bit more about that thought? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Only if you want to. So this is on frame three. It says, I wonder if barriers interfere with process as much as goals, or if we could think of it that way. Okay, guys, it's me. So I just feel irritating. <laughs> um, but really, all I was thinking about is like, there's so much about goals and the stuff that you guys are talking about and clarity around outcomes and variability in, in how you get there. 
But a lot of us, I think, particularly at Plymouth State, are interested in you know emergent curriculum, in co-creating learning outcomes with our students. So one, you know, a lot of times, I think, in some of the teaching that we do, particularly project-based work, we don't always know the goals, but we may have a sense of what a healthy or functional learning process will look like. So I'm just trying to think about shifting some of what you're saying towards looking at process and also like how do you involve students in goal setting in a way that still gives us something that will help us identify when we're getting stuck on barriers, you know? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because um, I tend to be very process oriented too. Like I always do have sort of a goal in mind, but it's true, you know, like when you're thinking about working with students, especially in our world, you know, we want them to be setting their own goals that are meaningful. And I mean, I think that's the case in K-12 as well. You know, I mean, ultimately, like if you're thinking about quote unquote, implementing UDL, I mean, that's one of the ultimate goals of it is to have students develop those skills to become those you know, sort of expert learners, right? And to be able to develop and, and work toward their own goals. I think I see barriers, you know, definitely in the process in terms of means. Um, so not just in terms of competing goals, but also in like, okay, well, what am I asking? Is there anything that I'm asking students to do that I'm spoiling a little bit what I'm going to say later, but um, is is yielding an unproductive struggle, right? So we're gonna be talking a little bit in the next section about productive versus un unproductive struggle and um, sort of unintentional and intentional barriers um, because some barriers are have a good reason, right? <laughs> you know, like learning's hard, it's supposed to be, <laughs> um, but is it in service of, you know, a goal that somebody has set or, you know, in service of, of further learning or is it just hard for the sake of being hard? So, but yeah, I think I think there's definitely room for more conversation around that for sure. So I, I know that I had said before we were holding, but I, I'm I'm replaying in my head what the next slides are and where we're going next. Um, I I think actually let's take a moment and on on the first frame the yellow sticky note that I did uh, put off keep off to the left hand side. I'm going to read it to folks right now, and, and I think let's take a moment, and I'd be very interested if whoever wrote it has an example in mind, um, where it says here, I'm always really interested in when the variability among students leads to conflict, when students need things that are actually in opposition. And, and Beth, I guess just to, just to focus on why I'm suggesting we do this now instead of waiting to the next bit is, I know that we don't have a next bit on the first idea, right? There, there is no next bit on the variability. It's, it's on yeah. numbers two, three, and four. So Martha, I see you coming on to screen and I see you on mute. It was mine. I guess it's yours. Yeah. So tell us a little me. bit about this. Yeah. Um, so the example, and it kind of touches on some stuff we've already talked about, but it comes, the example that comes to mind is about this idea of emergence and flexibility and structure. And so having definitely taught classes where I had some students who, who really wanted really clear goals, really clear structure, really well-defined, um, like well-articulated, like rubrics for grades. And then other students who, what helped them and what they really flourished with was having a much more emergent, open-ended, um, you know, uh, opportunity for defining their own goals and working towards that and, and thinking about assessment and grades differently. And, you know, it's possible to do both those things, but that's really like, you're talking about like one end of the continuum to the other in terms of pedagogy, which it's, you know, not easy to do. Um, and that, so that's like one idea to, that comes to mind, but I know that like from talking so people like um, Hannah Davidson and accessibility, like this is a concept that comes up a lot when you're dealing with people with different needs that they don't, it, it's not always as simple as saying design for, for the, you know, that those needs and it will help as many as possible that sometimes there really are tensions between those needs. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you do that, like how, how what kind of advice you would give for that. Beth, I have thoughts, but if you if you want to, no, go ahead. Okay, so, and I do think this brings us into the emergent conversation as well. Um, so, 
and Beth, I think this is going to throw off a little bit what we were intending to do moving forward, but, but I think it's worthwhile just to start with this. So Beth, no, no, don't be sorry at all. Um, Beth and I were intending then going back through the second, third, and fourth ideas with us sharing examples of our courses and then opening up of like, do people have questions about yours or things like that? So we're just going to reverse that order right now, I think. And so on this first one, let's, let's talk about your example that you've given. Um, so I think one of the things is this very, this identification of what's the, what's the primary goal and is it the primary goal of the assignment of the activity of the course of this particular interaction? And those aren't always the same as each other. Um, and so, and I'd also say, let's distinguish between the solution that the student has in mind to meet their need is not the same thing as what their need is. So the student, when they say, I need a clearly defined rubric and these exact rules and specifications, that is not a need. They need support in, in both the specifics of what you're looking for, as well as self-confidence for themselves that they're capable of getting there. Those are needs. And we can't ignore those and just say, too bad, you're in college, right? Like, no, no, those are real needs. And we need to be attending to those. They have a predetermined solution in their mind that either has worked for them in the past or they just believe has worked for them in the past. Um, but that's not the same as the need. And we don't, we don't need to cater to predetermined solutions that the student comes to the table with any more than we should cling to our preconceived solutions that we had. This whole idea of separating out goal from means right? That rubric, those are means, not goal, right? And so th th that's something that I think is really important uh, to be able to distinguish, not easy, but very important to distinguish between those things. Um, and that, that involves conversation. And then when you're talking about what the goal is of the course, and it's funny because Beth and I did talk ahead of time about particularly people who are teaching where we anticipated some of this question being is particularly people who are teaching courses where the habits of mind are purposefully supposed to be embedded in them, which on some level very much feels like it's the purposeful intertwining of goals and, and means. I don't know that it is, but it takes a lot more conversation around that um, because I don't know that it has to be innately that. So um, why don't we, Beth, I think actually maybe to start as a baseline, do you want to show the example from our course and we can kind of use that as a baseline and then and then pivot with that to answer this question more? Yes. <laughs> as Beth is bringing that up, I'm just going to say that was that was really nicely articulated, Brian. I, that really helped me to um, in my mind, figure out like what that nuance is. And, and in particular, that notion of like what a student thinks they need versus what they actually need. And then how we teach to that without being paternalistic, right? Or without just sort of shutting them down and saying, no, 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 you don't know what you need. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of con like um, complication to that, but I think it's a really interesting complication. I am super glad that was helpful and even more glad we're recording because there's no <laughs> way I'll replicate exactly what I'm recording. So. All right, so um, we were gonna talk a little bit about the design process, which to some extent does mimic, as Brian said, those, those um, last three uh, core concepts, right? So the design process when, in thinking about UDL is to set clear relevant goals, to anticipate barriers that might arise and then to design options that can potentially reduce or minimize those barriers. So when we were talking about setting and communicating goals, um, just some things to think about, you know, often we think, you know, what should students know and be able to do, but we also like to think really, you know, in terms of affect and why, why goals should even matter to students. And this kind of goes back to Robin's point about, you know, wanting to um, 
support students to create their own goals that are going to be meaningful for them, you know, and think about why should I invest in this? Why should I care? You know, what, what does this mean to me, to my community, to my family, um, you know, to my life in general? And, um, you know, what are some things that I might need to learn in order to actually, or, or to draw on to actually meet this type of goal? Um, so this is what um, Brian was referring to. So this is a, um, well, I'm just going to let you talk about it, actually. I don't, <laughs> I, don't need okay. to, I don't need to introduce it. Just go ahead. <laughs> So, you know, this is, this is a snippet out of one of our assignments for our course. Um, and it's only a snippet, so it doesn't actually get into the, the, uh, the, the, the primary content of what they're researching. But the idea is that they are researching a particular a aspect of variability. And so we've created categories of variability, of variability in fine motor, variability in gross motor and mobility, other types of variability. Um, but then what we're asking them to do is so this might be small for some of you, so I'll, I'll actually read some of it. So you and your group members will be responsible for creating an online resource that will be shared with the rest of the class for their current and future use. It should include, and then we have four bullets there that talk about the, essentially the, some of the competencies that are course competencies that this assignment is meant to help them satisfy. And so these are basic ideas that need to be captured within their project. And then underneath those four bullets, it says format. The resource your groups create should be online. That makes it more accessible and valuable for your classmates use, but the exact format is entirely up to your group. Lots of people use Padlet, but a Google Doc or Slides or any other online freely accessible platform can work. So the reason, the reason why I wanted to share this um, and then pivot to come back to your questions around emergent goals and things like that is, so you notice that what we're doing here is we're, st we're still being very specific about the kind of information that needs to be included in their project. And for this project, that's the goals. Now we've also made sure those goals very clearly line up with specific course competencies for our course. So they're not one-off things that if they don't meet them, it's not a big deal, but it, you know, and if they do meet them, it doesn't actually help them. They're very, very specific, right? So this is, this is the course on inclusive education and technology. So if you look through these, these are very clear, they line up with our course competencies, but how they're going to do it entirely up to them. That's that separation between the goal and the means. So when you're talking about emergent goals, and Robin, I want to make sure that I'm categorizing this correctly. What you're talking about is you and the students are together going to be identifying, while you already have a broad topic, you're going to be identifying, specifying subtopics. Um, and then within that, a thing that they're doing, right? Both, both researching and constructing essentially, right? And so at the beginning, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really just about coming up with this exact thing here, but maybe more co collaboratively with the students. Right, um, right. But you would still need this same kind of scaffold. Absolutely. But the other thing is, but well, what's the actual goal of the course? Because the course goal can't possibly really be those emergent goals. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have left it open, you know, like when, when you're like for the students to come up with, right? So the actual goals of the course are things around developing research skills, collaboration, communication skills, those sorts of things, right? For the students to understand those as clearly set ahead of time which I would presume, and is, is this tackling a wicked problem? I, you know, or, or is this a different course? Yeah, I mean, TWP is a good example. Our IDS courses are very, very weird this way, but, but TWP is a good example or anything that's like, um, that's like project-based where, right. yeah, yeah. So I think, and, and I will say this, being brand new here and not being involved with that, I, 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 it's possible some of the questions that I'm raising right now are, are purely out of ignorance. But I would think some of the questions that would need to be asked from a UDL perspective would be, 
could they be successful in the course goals? And, you know, I, I speak a lot of times in terms of competencies, those course competencies of research, collaboration, communication, and yet not be successful in the, in the emergent goals that they helped set. Is that possible? And is yeah. the opposite possible? that they could be successful in those emergent goals that they helped create, but they were actually a terrible group member and their research, you know, and those sorts of things. If either of those could be true, then we'd really need to think about assessment of the course. You know, like it would seem to me assessment of the course as well as supports of what do we make sure we're scaffolding and supporting for them should really be grounded in the course goals. And the emergent goals would be vehicles to get there. They, the emergent goals are essentially part of the means, which is why they're so flexible because they're not actually the course goals. Um, that doesn't mean they don't matter at all. Me means do matter. Um, but for you, those course goals are process oriented goals. And so I think when you were also asking about, um, does the barrier get in the way of the process versus that, I think part of it is our language, you know, is that I, I, th I wonder whether you're using the word goal to mean product and I'm you, Beth and I are using goal to mean like purpose of the course goal, in which case, the process is the is that goal, um, and the product weirdly is actually just the means. That's exactly right. I think a lot of the new pedagogies that we're experience, experimenting with at Plymouth State right now absolutely move the goals um, into process, and really, it's very much in some ways about that self regulated learning. Right, the goal is to learn how to design one's own learning process and continue learning and be self-motivated to learn and learn. Um, so you just have to kind of recalibrate, you know, how you think about, uh, how you think about goals. Um, but all of this stuff I think is still, is still com completely relevant. But I think you're right because on a micro level, especially in project-based learning, you know, students are setting, creating and setting goals a lot. And they're also, failing to reach them many, many times and still potentially earning an A in the course at the same time. So, um, so it, you know, I think that it's just an interesting kind of um, dance that you have to do when you're talking to faculty about, you know, how you have clarity and emergence, how you set goals, but welcome, you know, student self-direction, but all of this stuff is still relevant. I, I, I think it works great. I would just add that a lot of that thinking is, is a lot of the stuff that Brian and I end up doing like in our in our processing of, of our own course. Um, and it's been really helpful because I'm we so we're as Brian mentioned, we're doing this as a competency-based um, course, which is something he does all the time and has been doing. Um, but it was it was fairly new to me. Um, but but it we were seeing the same kinds of things, you know, and it's hard, you know, when you see students especially who are, are doing a lot of the work. Um, and, and still sort of struggling to actually demonstrate evidence of the competencies, you know, to help support them in persisting and, 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 and staying motivated and, and, you know, being sort of directed in their learning. Um, but it's been really interesting to just see the, you know, how, how UDL kind of comes together with competency. There's been a really awesome learning experience, um, you know, for me just to, to work with Brian on these competencies and the way that he's designed the course. It's um, just made me think in really totally different ways about, about course design and, and student learning. Any other thoughts before I move on? Let's point out what moving on means we're moving on to. <laughs> what are we moving on to? <laughs> so after the clear goals, flexible means the next one is barriers are in the environment. <laughs> yes. All right. So we want to be able to anticipate barriers that are in the environment. And here's my pogo stick people again. So this is getting onto that whole idea of a productive struggle. And when we, we talk about barriers, we're talking about something that is an unproductive struggle, not something that just makes things hard, right? And I think in higher ed, um, this is where it can get really murky because so much of what we do um, is 
you know, the ableism of the academy, right? <laughs> um, that, you know, so many of us have just grown up with and, and been socialized into, even if we don't take part of it, you know, we recognize that it's kind of baked into the environment in many ways. And, um, you know, ideas of, of rigor and um, excellence and um, writing as sort of, you know, the primary mode of communication or reading as the primary mode of acquiring knowledge um, can be really hard to push against and disentangle from what our actual goals might be for our students um, and what we're hoping to do. So. Um, we want to think of a barrier as an unproductive struggle, which is something that just interferes with the student's ability to to work toward their goal. Right? Um, it's it's when things are hard just for the sake of of being hard, um, and these can be found in physical surroundings. They can be found in curriculum. They can be found in instructional methods, in competing goals. Um, but what they're not <laughs> is in students, right? So it's the problem isn't that. Our students are really terrible writers. <laughs> um, we want to think about is actually reframing some of that language so that we're always situating barriers or problems within the environment rather than within our students. We've done a lot of work together over the years on barrier analyses um, and just working, you know, really trying to intentionally embed aspects of UDL into our practice. And I think one of the most challenging things is trying to in identify and minimize a barrier that you don't recognize as a barrier yourself, right? Because obviously, if you knew it was a barrier, you probably wouldn't have put it there. Um, and it's really, it's hard to recognize these. Um, so one of the things that we found is helpful is thinking about, okay, well, where What's, where does learning stop, right? Like, what am I always reteaching? Is there a particular concept that every time we come around to it, students really seem to be struggling? Um, and are they struggling in a way that's in service of the goal, right? Like, is it always, are they struggling in a way that's eventually gonna help them by engaging in that struggle to get there? Or is the struggle just a distraction, right? So are they, are they struggling to engage around a topic or are they struggling to post in the discussion board? Um, those are two very different things, right? So writing a discussion post is a very different thing than, you know, thinking about questions or responding to questions that we might have around a certain topic. It's super helpful to have a buddy <laughs> or a team to talk about barriers with, um, you know, to share syllabi and to look over assignments um, and any type of instructional materials that you might be, be using because odds are you don't all experience the same barriers. Um, and it's just helpful, you know, to also sometimes expose some of those more systemic barriers, um, you know, like the sort of premium that tends to be on rigor and reading and writing, um, especially in higher education. So we thought it'd be fun <laughs> to play a little barrier game. Um, this is one of the things that we've we've done with our own work over the years, um, and we've also done we we do with students as well. Um, so let's imagine that we have a goal, right? Um, and the goal, let's call this like an environmental science goal, um, is for students to understand current, current methods of waste disposal and its risks to human health. And then we ask them to create a 20 minute PowerPoint that they would present to a state or local government to make them aware of the human health risks and then to present that to the class. So we have our clear goal, but what might be some potential barriers? in this task. And um, I don't know, I can't read the chat right now, but um, I don't know if people are posting things in the chat. Brian, feel free to unmute and, or anybody feel free to unmute. <laughs> I, I have it, I have it open in front of me and I can, I, I can do a, a written. Um, so yeah, so not knowing how to use PowerPoint could be a possible one, not knowing how to present if you're speaking in front of the class. working under a time constraint. Yeah, so any of those, right? The, you know, we have barriers in method, barriers in means, barriers in um, engagement. Maybe, you know, some people might not, you know, necessarily want to present to their local or state government, right? So there's all sorts of barriers that don't have necessarily have anything to do about students under, do with understanding current methods of waste disposal and risks to human health. 
There's right. all kinds of ways that students might demonstrate their knowledge and understanding of that topic. Um, I'm gonna, I think maybe skip this one in the interest of time. <laughs> Um, so one of the big questions that we often hear is, does minimizing barriers make things too easy? Um, I will very crudely say something I would never say, but one of the questions that we often get is, isn't that just dumbing things down, right? Um, and the answer is no, <laughs> it's actually just the opposite because when we minimize the unproductive struggle, we're actually clearing the path for students to be able to focus on what really matters in the task. Um, and again, this whole idea of rigor that tends to be really kind of embedded in a lot of our world, um, just because something is hard doesn't necessarily mean it's rigorous. I'm not even sure I have a clear definition of rigor because I feel like it's not only ableist, but racist in many ways. <laughs> um, but just because something is rigorous doesn't mean that students are learning. Sometimes things are just hard because they're hard. Can I ask a quick question about this? I know time is yeah. of the essence, but um, I, I think this is a big one for faculty is like, it's not so much that like people who care about this stuff, they like people like us, we don't generally say, ah, you're dumbing it down. But one thing we might say is like in that PowerPoint example, like um, Gen Ed has a whole bunch of goals that a lot of times we mishmash you know onto a goal of learning about waste disposal and it might be like oh look this powerpoint thing teaches you how to use technology it teaches you how to speak in public and and then you have a student like with a real phobia of speaking in public and we say oh but that's one of the gen ed goals you have to learn some techniques to get more comfortable speaking in public but is it maybe a problem that we just like glom on too many of those goals and we don't actually like because I'm not so much worried we're dumbing it down, but I, I do think people would say, but like learning how to use PowerPoint or learning how to work under a deadline or learning how to speak in public, these are important skills that we need to teach. So how, what do you say to people who say that about the PowerPoint example, for example? Yeah, we've been having this conversation a lot lately. I mean, you to answer your question, Yes, I, I do think it's a problem. <laughs> um, I, I think I, I don't necessarily have a solution. I don't, so I don't know a lot of about as I, I teach mostly in sort of the, the grad level where we don't necessarily have those habits of mind or, or whatever they are. But um, yeah, I mean, it is, that's the danger of having competing goals, right? That's the pogo stick. <laughs> um, you know, that's having to hop to make an introduction because what happens is then that completely interferes with what, you know, your real focus is if you're an environmental science professor, which is having students understand a really crucial aspect of the, of the topic under study. Um, and it might have totally masked their ability to demonstrate their understanding of that. Um, so that comes at a cost. And it's not that there couldn't be other opportunities for them to, you know, use technology. Um, but we don't need to be dictating where those happen. It, it, that's, I mean, that, those are my initial thoughts. But go ahead, Brian, if you want to jump in. Yeah, I mean, so as Beth said, you know, when she says we've been talking about this a lot recently, what she means is like yesterday in the inclusive education course, we were having this conversation with students. Um, and in part because while there are students from all across campus that take that course, you know, from, from many of the different teacher prep programs, um, one of the primary ones is the elementary ed. And as elementary ed teachers, it's very explicit that you're teaching across subject areas and it's very, very common to be explicitly encouraged to create activities and forms of assessment that do clump together a whole mess of goals. And so, yeah, this comes up a lot. And the truth of the matter is, um, I think there's two parts to that answer. Well, it's probably more than two parts. There's two parts I'm gonna say to that answer. Um, so one part is, let's make sure we're really clear about the goal. So for example, public speaking, um, I, again, this is potentially me speaking out of turn and out of ignorance, because I'm not, I'm not part of all those conversations, but I'm still gonna say it anyhow. Um, like public speaking, is that really the goal or is the goal about um, public facing communication, right? Because the truth of the matter is, um, you know, this isn't, you, th this isn't presidential debates, you know, you know, from the 1800s, you know, where literally you had to stand up on a stage in front of a live audience to be able to make your point. N no one does that now. There are so many better ways and more appropriate for our era 
to, to um, present persuasive information or important information to a public facing audience or a specified audience, right? So it could be, and you let them specify the exact audience, but th that makes sense to them. So, but even once you've specified that, to narrow it down that it may not just be public speaking, it, it's this other particular thing, but does it have to be in collaboration with that particular content? Once you decouple those and, and be clear with students ahead of time, both of these are course competencies. Here is a way you could do double duty, but here are multiple opportunities throughout the course for you to demonstrate either of those competencies. You know, and, um, and again, as, as Beth pointed out, I, I very much focus on competency base and I, and I have been for a number of years and I do across my courses now. And it's a big, you know, mind blowing thing for the students when they first come in. And they are very certain initially that that's what's getting in the way, that's their barrier. Uh, and then we have conversations around it. And I am very particular that I design things so that every competency, and I normally have somewhere between like six and eight competencies for the course. Every one of them, there are multiple opportunities during the semester to both develop and demonstrate those competencies. And most assignments they do could be used to demonstrate multiple competencies. So there's an enormous amount of redundancy, which is what learning requires, because you need time to practice, another scenario to try it out in. And so lots of times students demonstrate one of the competencies, not in a way that I had anticipated, but it worked for them, but they know them up front. Um, and then lastly, so I guess there was three ways I was gonna answer. Um, and I saw that in chat, you mentioned this, uh, Robin, is that if we are assessing them as a competency for the course, then, then I would argue as educators, then, then we're responsible for supporting their learning in that. It, it is inappropriate for us to hold them accountable for competencies that we did not teach them and support them in. Um, and so did you teach them public speaking throughout? <laughs> you know, and did you give them enough opportunities to practice where they would get over that? Um, so I think all of those things combined together. I'm glancing over at chat. So go, go ahead, Beth, please save me okay. from starting to ramble. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to close up the barriers um, conversation by um, just, you know, also reading it's, it's easy to think of this as like, oh, I just, you know, like that example, you know, like, oh, I just find the barriers and I remove them and then everything's fine. Um, the bigger thing to think about and, and that we don't have time to get into today is that there are many systemic barriers, right? Um, and the barriers actually send a really clear message if you um, aren't constantly evaluating and reflecting on your practice and noting where barriers are and attempting to minimize them. Um, so this is a, an example that um, was often shared with, with in much of our training materials from CAST. Um, this is a, a school in Boston. As you can see, it's a very narrow gateway to access the school. And then there's two sorts of steps to actually get in the door. And I don't know if you can see the tiny little blue sign by the door, but this is what it says. So this sends a really clear message um, about who belongs. <laughs> and where they belong. Um, because if you've just managed to get yourself up to a point where you could actually read the side, you've probably already spent a good amount of time struggling just to get there. And now to be told that you're not allowed in through the front door um, sends a really clear message. Um, Brian did a great job too yesterday of talking with our students about the fact that it also sends a message to students who don't have to think about that, right? To students who can walk right in. Um, and do you wanna jump in Brian and give a, 30 second explanation of. <laughs> sure, sure, briefly. And, and I think part of the value of this is also reaching across disability to other forms of marginalized intersectional identities is that when you hear people talk about, well, we don't need to attend to that here because we don't have many of those people here. That is the influence of these types of messaging. Of, of course, if you've spent every day walking through those front doors unhampered with no problems, of course you think there aren't many people with mobility issues who go there, in part because they have to go around back. You don't walk in with them. 
and in part because lots of lots of people with those issues are going to choose to not go there because it's an unwelcoming situation. We encounter this a lot in our environment. Then when we also start talking about issues of race, gender identity, LGBTQ uh, community of, you know, you hear people who don't want to have those conversations say, well, those people aren't here. And first off, a lot of times they're wrong. You just have an environment where those people are not comfortable <laughs> identifying themselves as such. But even when you're right, part of it is because those people have gotten the message that they don't belong there, um, which is why they aren't there. And so this is not just about messaging to the people who are on the receiving end to it. It's about creating that water we swim in of ableism, sexism, um, racism, and otherwise. I'm going to introduce these, but then I'm not going to go through the slides because we don't have time and nobody needs to hear me talk super fast. Um, so when we think about designing options to actually reduce some of these barriers, remember the, the process was um, setting clear, flex, clear goals with flexible means, um, anticipating potential barriers, and then designing options to reduce those barriers. Um, CAST has developed a set of guidelines to help educators do this. And these are called the UDL guidelines. And I'm quoting from the website here. These are just a tool to use in implementing UDL. They offer a set of concrete suggestions that can be applied to any discipline or domain um, to really support every learner in accessing and participating in meaningful, challenging learning opportunities. Um, these are three of the primary ways that learners vary. Of course, we recognize that they vary in ways well beyond how they might engage with material, how they take in information, and then how they act on what they've learned. Um, but these are three primary ways that really drive the organization of the UDL guidelines. Um, and Brian, do you mind throwing the link to the UDL guidelines in the chat? Because I don't actually think I managed to hyperlink that on this particular slide. Um, these are things that you know we could spend hours talking about and exploring, and we certainly don't have time in the few remaining minutes that we have. Um, but I do think it's important to mention that they're not a rubric, they're not a checklist, nor are they meant to be implemented simultaneously or in order. Um, they're also not UDL operationalized, right? Again, they're just a tool, but they can be really helpful when you're starting. Um, and I know there's a lot of tension that we alluded to between you know, the sort of mindset and strategies, but oftentimes you know, taking those initial steps, just doing some of those initial strategies, we found can actually really help push your mindset a little bit further. Once you start automatically doing things in that frame of access mind, um, then you start can start you know kind of going back and thinking more intentionally about your design rather than just retrofitting, right? Rather than thinking like, oh, I'm going to make this quick fix and then I'm going to be doing UDL or then I'm going to be doing access and then I'm going to be giving accommodations to everyone. You can actually start to think really intentionally about your redesign and what your purpose is in designing for all the variability that you know exists. So there's a few slides here that you have access to. Um, they just point to some of the ways that these are organized. They're organized both vertically and horizontally. And they do tend to get a little bit more complex as you go sort of down. Um, they tend to move from a little bit more teacher driven to a little bit more um, student driven. Where's my animation? If you go to the guidelines website, um, there are some really helpful videos that talk about the organization and you can actually click on each individual guideline and look at some of the research um, and development work that's been done in developing those. Um, with the caveat that they are undergoing significant revision right now. Um, one of the things that um, researchers at CAST have been kind of struggling with over the past few years is the fact that these guidelines really don't attend to um, issues of you know, systemic inequity um, and how can, they, how can they support educators, how can we develop guidelines that support educators to address that in their teaching. Um, so there's a great initiative called Rising to Equity. Um, a team of, of researchers and educators from all over the world are working together to really think about how to meaningfully redesign these. Um, so I encourage you to, to check that out if you haven't already. They're a, use, a super useful tool. There's a lot of great videos um, to support people with that. Um, Brian, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the resources that we're offering for people? <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so very briefly, since we only have a moment, a few moments here, um, the visual that Beth just had on the screen just a moment ago, this, this actually comes from a Google Doc uh, that I just put the link into chat 
but it's also linked here on the final, you can go ahead and forward, um, on the this slide where it says resource list. This is a Google Doc that we've created that we use with our students here at PSU. It's also one, uh, both Beth and I do some work with surrounding schools uh, throughout New Hampshire to encourage the use of UDL um, and help them um, improve their practices. So yes, you can post that with the resources. I don't see any reason why not. It's just a Google Doc that we created. Um, we're constantly trying to improve it. it. Like it's not perfect, but it has a lot of links, many from CAS, but from other places too, including uh, Todd Rose's Myth of Average video and other things. I have it broken up into the UDL thinking, UDL how-to, and then beyond UDL. Um, and here we mostly talked about UDL thinking and a little bit of the how-to, um, and we didn't even get to the beyond all that much. So perhaps future uh, workshops. The other thing is that next link on uh, learning design. So CAST in association with learning design, which is kind of a spinoff for them, they have online modules to learn more about UDL as well as a lot of other things. Um, they have micro credentials. The UDL level one, oh, thank you. Matt. The UDL level one micro credential we require for our students to get in some of our courses. It is not normally free. It normally, I think, is $30. But we have arranged with uh, New Hampshire Department of Education that they are covering the cost not only for our students, because the, the state of New Hampshire wants for all teachers in the state or as many as possible to get this and to start using UDL. So they already had this set up. So we have arranged for, you can see, Beth, I don't know if you wanna highlight it real quick, uh, where it says th there's a code there that it, even for faculty here at PSU, um, they, are, they are happy this spring and summer you know, to cover the, that $30 cost up to a certain number of people uh, to be able to get that micro credential. And we'd really encourage it. It takes, most of our students have said it takes them about three hours or so to go through it, including taking the test for it. Um, and this has all the explanations of how to sign up, how to go into it. Um, the UDL level two credential, which we can, can't get them to cover for free, um, I think has a $60 cost is really fantastic because it re that one really is how to redesign curriculum um, through a UDL lens. It's, it's very good. I'm, I'm working with some of my upper level elementary ed students to, to get that as a micro credential to go on their resumes. So um, yes, we would be happy to be involved with stuff during the summer. And then the Padlet, Beth, I'll let you uh, plus, I actually, it's, it might be a little bit dated. I, I made it a couple of years ago, but it's all res UDL resources that are geared toward higher education. So I'll be updating that. So there's some articles, links to the guidelines, things like that, that, um, you know, faculty in higher ed might find um, particularly useful um, just in their teaching. And just to let folks know, I will, um, it, it will take me a little while to get it processed, but I will post the video of this, um, but I'll also take these um, different resources, the slide deck and the um, Google Doc and put those all with the video so that when you go to the collab resources page, um, you'll be able to access all of that in one place because there's some really great stuff in here. Um, and I will definitely look into the micro credential. Um, not that people can't just go ahead and go do that, but if you want, um, I'll have the collab maybe send something out just in case people would like a buddy. You know, sometimes you, you have more accountability to getting doing something if you know a few other people are doing it. So um, I'll look into that and um, send a word out to PSU folks. Um, but I really want to thank Brian and Beth. Um, and I heard you gesturing to coming back and doing more with us because um, I think there's a real real interest in this. So we'll be knocking on your door, but thank you so much. It was really, really wonderful. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and then if folks need to hang out for a second, if you have last minute questions, that's fine. So thanks again. Thanks everyone. Thank you.